foot and ankle region, because of its weight-bearing function in the bipedal human, is prone to injury. Due to the stress concentration, minor anatomical abnormalities or deformities can cause a major disability for the patient. Inspection. The shoes are the first area to be inspected. Abnormal or asymmetrical wear patterns visualized on the shoes frequently reflect the anatomical problem in the foot. The foot and ankle region must not be considered alone, but in conjunction with the remainder of the lower extremities, and the patient must be undressed from the waist down. Gait can be severely affected by foot abnormalities, and the patient's gait pattern should be thoroughly assessed. The patient should then be observed in the stance position with weight borne equally on both lower extremities. Areas to note include the toes, which should be flat and straight. The alignment of the forefoot and the individual rays should also be noted. In this patient, note the hallux valgus deformity of the big toe as well as the hammer toe deformities of the lateral toes. In the normal patient, note the presence of the longitudinal arch. The patient must also be observed from behind to assess the alignment of the hind foot, which is normally in slight valgus. It is useful at this point in time to have the patient walk again and this time observe sequentially the toes, forefoot, midfoot, and hindfoot during the gait cycle. With the patient sitting on the examining table and the legs dangling over the side, observe the feet in the non-weight-bearing relaxed position. It is wise to follow the same pattern of observation, for example, toes, forefoot, midfoot, and hindfoot so that nothing is missed. The skin of the foot and ankle region must be thoroughly inspected for any alteration in texture or thickness. Increased thickness of the skin, a callosity, reflects the response to increased pressure and may be present in areas which normally do not bear excessive pressure or weight. Any swelling, scars, cutaneous lesions, or obvious color changes, as well as nail condition, should be noted and documented at this time. It is essential to inspect the skin between the toes, and this obviously will involve passively separating the toes in order to do so. Palpation. The patient should be sitting on the examining table with the legs dangling over the edge, and the examiner should sit on a stool, facing the patient so that the feet are placed at a comfortable level. The examiner now begins to palpate the foot, always comparing one foot to the patient's other foot. In order to accurately localize problems in the foot, the bony landmarks must be identified, and it is essential to progress in a methodical, systematic fashion. As well, the examiner must be cognizant of the areas of tenderness or deformity detected both while palpating the bony landmarks and subsequently the soft tissue landmarks. Bony Landmarks the bony landmarks palpable on the medial aspect of the foot include the following. First metatarsal head, navicular tubercle, head of the talus, medial malleolus, and sustentaculum tali. The examiner should initially stabilize the hind foot by cupping the calcaneus and with the other hand palpate the bony landmarks. Beginning on the medial aspect of the forefoot, the first metatarsal head and first metatarsal phalangeal joint are identified. The first metatarsal can be followed proximally to its flare at the base which signifies the region of the first metatarsal cuneiform joint. Moving proximally along the same line, the tubercle of the navicular bone is palpated. Immediately proximal to the navicular tubercle, the head of the talus can be palpated, and this can be accentuated by everting the forefoot. The medial malleolus is then localized and serves as an important landmark. Moving directly downwards towards the sole of the foot, about 1.5 centimeters from the tip of the medial malleolus, the sustentaculum tali can be palpated. On the dorsum of the foot, each toe and metatarsal is palpated in order to detect any tenderness or deformity. 
More proximally, the mid-tarsal region is palpated. Attention should then be turned to the lateral aspect of the foot while continuing to stabilize the hind foot. Lateral bony landmarks include the fifth metatarsal head, cuboid, calcaneus, and perineal tubercle, and the lateral malleolus. Palpate the head of the fifth metatarsal and localize the fifth metatarsal phalangeal joint. The fifth metatarsal is followed proximally to its flare, and the depression just proximal to this localizes the cuboid region. More proximally, the lateral border of the calcaneus is readily palpable, and approximately in the middle of the field is the perineal tubercle, which separates the perineus brevis and the perineus longus tendons as they course along the lateral border of the calcaneus. The lateral malleolus, or distal end of the fibula, is then identified. The examiner should note that it extends farther distally than the medial malleolus and is also located more posteriorly than the medial malleolus. While the thumb is pressing anterior to the lateral malleolus, plantar flex the foot and the anterolateral aspect of the Taylor dome becomes palpable. Plantar surface or sole. At this point, it is advantageous for the patient to lie down so that the lower leg and foot can be relaxed and supported by the examining table. Beginning at the forefoot, the metatarsal heads are palpated in turn. They are palpated with the thumb while the dorsal aspect is stabilized with the index finger. Under the first metatarsal head, you may be able to feel the two sesamoid bones. Posteriorly, on the inframedial border of the calcaneus, the region of the medial tubercle should be palpated. Because of the thick heel pad, the actual bony prominence may not be palpable, the tenderness elicited in this region is indicative of plantar fasciitis or the so-called heel spur. Soft tissues. Likewise, proceed to palpate the soft tissues in a systematic fashion. In the forefoot, beginning in the region of the first metatarsal head, the bursa over the medial aspect of the first metatarsal is palpated. Colostes under the metatarsal head may be identified and tenderness between the metatarsal heads indicates the possibility of perineural fibrosis, often called a Morton's neuroma. Progressing along the medial border of the foot, just proximal to the navicular tubercle, palpate the region of the posterior tibial tendon insertion. Posterior to the medial malleolus, the examiner can identify the posterior tibial tendon, which can be accentuated by having the patient plantar flex and invert the foot. Dorsum of foot. The soft tissues which can be palpated dorsally include the tibialis anterior tendon and the tendons of the extensor hallucis longus and extensor digitorum longus. The tibialis anterior tendon can be highlighted by having the patient dorsiflex and invert the foot. The extensor hallucis longus and extensor digitorum longus tendons are easily found by asking the patient to dorsiflex the big toe and subsequently the lateral toes. Beginning distally on the lateral border of the foot, Examine for thickening over the lateral aspect of the fifth metatarsal head. Thickening or swelling in this region may be due to a callosity or to bursal inflammation. Proximally, at the level of the lateral malleolus, the actual bands of the lateral ligament complex of the ankle cannot be individually identified. Therefore, their approximate position should be palpated and any tenderness or thickening noted. These three bands are from anterior to posterior, the anterior talofibular ligament, the calcaneofibular ligament, and the posterior talofibular ligament. The perineus longus and brevis tendons can be accentuated and localized by having the patient plantar flex and evert the foot. 
Posteriorly, the examiner can palpate the Achilles tendon, which can be highlighted by having the patient plantar flex the foot against resistance, for example, the examiner's knee. Carefully palpate the tendon in the lower third of the leg to its insertion on the posterior aspect of the calcaneus, noting specifically tenderness, swelling, thickening, or interruption of continuity. The Achilles tendon actually attaches inferiorly on the posterior aspect of the calcaneus. Between the posterior aspect of the calcaneus and the free, unattached portion of the Achilles tendon is the retrocalcaneal bursa, and this region is palpated by pinching the soft tissue directly anterior to the Achilles tendon. Thickening or tenderness to palpation posterior to the Achilles tendon suggests an inflammatory condition of the calcaneal bursa. Ankle joint. The location of the ankle joint, the tibial tailor joint, can be approximated by following the anterior border of the medial malleolus upwards to its junction with the tibia. Proceed horizontally towards the anterior border of the lateral malleolus, and this line localizes the level of the ankle joint. Tenderness to palpation of this region suggests inflammation, and fluctuation may suggest either fluid or synovial thickening within the ankle joint. Lastly, the soft tissues of the plantar surface of the foot should be palpated, and again, this is best performed with the patient lying down. The regions between the metatarsal heads must be palpated. Posteriorly, the medial tubercle of the calcaneus should be located, and the sole of the foot palpated in the region of the plantar fascia, looking for areas of tenderness, swelling, or deformity. Range of motion. The examiner must check both active and passive range of motion. Unlike the hip, which involves a single joint, the foot and ankle complex comprises many joints, and the examiner must be able to carefully assess the motion of the various joints individually. In testing for active motion, more than one joint is usually involved and passive motion must be examined in order for the basic motions of the foot and ankle to be determined. These are as follows. One, ankle joint. Dorsiflexion, plantar flexion. Two, subtalar joint. Inversion, eversion. Three, Mid-tarsal motion, forefoot adduction, forefoot abduction, forefoot dorsiflexion, forefoot plantar flexion. Four, toe motion, flexion, extension. It is difficult, if not impossible, for the patient themselves to isolate these above motions, and in observing active motion, several joints may come into play. The examiner can assess a specific joint or joints more accurately by testing passive motion. Ankle motion. The patient should sit on the examining table with the legs dangling over the edge. This relaxes the gastrocnemius soleus complex, which can inhibit dorsiflexion at the ankle. Grasp the calcaneus with one hand and forcibly invert the foot to eliminate forefoot motion. Passively dorsiflex and plantar flex from the neutral position, which is at 90 degrees, to the tibia, and record the ranges observed. In the normal, 20 degrees of dorsiflexion and 50 degrees of plantar flexion are noted, but always compare with the opposite extremity. Subtalar motion. The forefoot is held in the neutral position at 90 degrees to the tibia. This is necessary to lock the wider anterior part of the tailor dome into the ankle mortis. With the other hand, grasp the calcaneus and invert and evert the calcaneus from the neutral or rest position. There is approximately 10 to 15 degrees of inversion and 0 to 5 degrees of eversion at the subtalar joint, although the range is variable in normal individuals. Tarsal coalition is a common cause of restricted subtalar motion. Mid-tarsal motion. 
Abduction and adduction of the forefoot take place at the mid-tarsal joint, with the foot held at 90 degrees to lock the talus in the ankle mortis and the calcaneus grasped by the other hand, abduct and adduct the forefoot from the neutral or rest position. Normal patients have 20 degrees of adduction and 10 degrees of abduction. Passive dorsiflexion and plantar flexion should also be assessed at the mid-tarsal joints. Note when testing motion actively, the patient is not able to isolate the motion at the subtalar and mid-tarsal joints, and it is the combination of movements at these two joints that result in supination, inversion and adduction, and pronation, eversion and abduction. Toes. The first metatarsal phalangeal joint motion is extremely important in the toe-off phase of the gait cycle, and 35 to 40 degrees of pain-free passive extension are required. It is therefore essential that the examiner attentively examine motion at this joint. Stabilize the forefoot and passively extend and flex the first metatarsal phalangeal joint. Take care to stabilize the interphalangeal joint of the big toe so that the motion recorded is not in part coming from the interphalangeal joint, especially when testing flexion. The normal individual may have from 70 to 90 degrees of extension and approximately 45 degrees of flexion at the first metatarsal phalangeal joint. Next, examine the interphalangeal joint of the great toe by stabilizing the proximal phalanx to eliminate metatarsal phalangeal motion. Note that from the neutral position in the normal patient, flexion alone of approximately 90 degrees can be obtained at the interphalangeal joint of the great toe. There is no extension at the interphalangeal joint of the great toe. In a similar manner, the motions at each of the lesser toes, 2 to 5, must be examined. Of note in the lesser toes is the fact that there are two interphalangeal joints, and each of these interphalangeal joints, as well as the metatarsal phalangeal joint, must be individually assessed. Active extension takes place only at the metatarsal phalangeal joint, while flexion of the lesser toes involves the metatarsal phalangeal and interphalangeal joints. Neurological Examination The detailed neurological examination of the foot and ankle will be covered in the video program on the physical examination of the lumbar spine and neurological examination of the lower extremities, but would normally be performed at this point in time. Vascular Examination Examination of the vascular status is an extremely important part of the physical examination of the foot and ankle. The foot and ankle are at the end of the line, so to speak, and vascular alterations both proximally and distally can have enormous effects on the foot and ankle region. The hair distribution and the appearance of skin texture over the lower leg are important aspects to note. The appearance of varicostes in the lower extremity, as well as stasis dermatitis or stasis ulcers are also noted. With the patient lying in a relaxed position, the capillary filling can be assessed by squeezing the nail bed and recording the time for blanching to disappear. The pulses are then palpated and compared to the opposite extremity. The posterior tibial artery is located behind the medial malleolus between the tendons of the flexor digitorum longus and the flexor hallucis longus. This artery provides the main blood supply to the foot. It is most easily palpable when the accompanying tendons are relaxed and thus the patient should be in the supine position with the whole lower extremity supported by the examining table. The anterior tibular artery or dorsalis pedis artery is located between the tendons of the extensor hallucis longus and the extensor digitorum longus. These tendons have been located previously during the examination. It is the dorsalis pedis artery that is most easily palpable about two inches below the ankle joint. If on the basis of the vascular examination insufficiency is suspected, 
The quality of the pulses should be reassessed after the patient has been exercised. Special tests. Ankle instability. Ankle sprains are a common everyday occurrence, both during athletic endeavors as well as occurring in general everyday activities. Inversion injuries are more common, hence injuries to the lateral ligament complex are seen more frequently than are injuries to the medial deltoid ligament. Spine echinosis or tenderness, if detected earlier in the examination, will make the examiner aware of the possibility of a lateral ligament complex injury. The examiner must try to assess the degree of injury and determine if any instability of the ankle joint is present. In a complete tear of the anterior talofibular ligament, the restraint preventing forward sliding of the talus in the ankle mortis is lost. With the patient sitting on the examining table, the hind foot is grasped by the examiner's cupped hand, while the opposite hand grasps the lower end of the tibia just above the malleoli. Anterior pull of the hind foot is applied at the same time as posterior push on the lower tibia. Excessive anterior motion of the hind foot, as compared to the opposite extremity, denotes anterior instability. The examiner may appreciate a clunk as the talus subluxes forward out of the ankle mortis. The anterior drawer test may not be diagnostic if the pain of the acute injury prevents full patient relaxation and cooperation. Local or general anesthesia may have to be utilized in order to perform instability tests accurately. For lateral instability, both the anterior talofibular ligament and the calcaneofibular ligament must be torn. This injury will allow the talus to tilt in the ankle mortis. When testing for lateral instability, the ankle should be allowed to plantar flex to approximately 30 degrees. The junction of the mid and hind foot are grasped in the examiner's hand and an inversion stress applied. Carefully palpating laterally, the examiner may appreciate gaping of the lateral soft tissues as well as tilting of the talus. Since tailor tilt may be found in the normal subject without a previous injury to the ankle, it is absolutely essential to compare the opposite normal extremity. The examiner must be certain that the increased inversion is occurring because of tailor tilt and not because of subtalar instability. Both the anterior drawer test and the tailor tilt test should be confirmed radiologically if thought to be present clinically. To test medial instability, which is much less common, the examiner applies a knee version stress to the junction of the mid and hind foot and carefully palpates the medial aspect of the ankle joint for gaping or widening. Achilles tendon rupture. With any injury involving the lower leg, the integrity of the Achilles tendon must be ascertained. Approximately 25% of Achilles tendon ruptures are missed because of failure to adequately examine for continuity of the Achilles tendon. In order to test the integrity of the Achilles tendon, the patient may be examined in any of the following three positions. Kneeling on a chair, lying prone with the feet, suspended over the end of the examining table or lying prone with the knees flexed to 90 degrees. In either of these three positions, squeezing the calf will cause plantar flexion of the foot if the Achilles tendon is intact. Failure of the foot to plantar flex signifies a rupture of the Achilles tendon. Gastrocnemius soleus contractor. If during the examination the range of ankle dorsiflexion is decreased, the examiner must try and ascertain the reason. Structural abnormalities about the ankle joint may prevent dorsiflexion, but also contracture of the gastrocnemius or the soleus muscles can limit dorsiflexion. With the knee extended, passive dorsiflexion of the ankle may be limited by the gastrocnemius and or the soleus muscle. 
If the knee is then flexed, the gastrocnemius muscle, since it originates above the knee, is relaxed, and a failure to gain passive dorsiflexion would implicate the soleus muscle as being the cause. Conversely, if dorsiflexion is achieved with the knee bent, but not with the knee straight, then a contracture of the gastrocnemius muscle is the cause. Holman's sign. Holman's sign is a test for deep vein thrombophlebitis. The patient lies supine with the leg extended and the foot and ankle are forcibly dorsiflexed. Pain elicited in the calf region in response to this test indicates a positive Holman's sign. This sign is certainly not pathognomonic and must be correlated with other physical findings suggestive of deep vein thrombosis. In summary, the foot and ankle region have been examined in detail. You are reminded, however, that the examination of the foot and ankle is not complete without the corresponding examination of the lumbar spine, hip, and knee.